make sure for the exam, which does not cover the material that we're covering today, that you cover all the questions. Next class, I'm going to go over in detail the format. One of the reasons is I don't want students knocking on my door like a lost puppy saying I don't want to do this course for the fourth or fifth time. Neither do I. So, I will go over the format. We, we hope that the average will be in the high 60s. That's what we're aiming for. At least the high to mid 60s. Not much higher than that. The quiz will be after the exam. We're not going to do it on a Thursday because it's not fair. It's better to go, yeah, happy, happy, joy, joy. It will be after the exam. A retarded baboon or his favorite cousin should be able to pass it. Even, well, I won't make too many jokes because I'm going to fail. But the point is this. You know the quiz is there partially for theory and partially to make the marks you know, normalize as high as we can to B minus. But the final will be very challenging. You know this. Okay, what did we talk about last time? Oh, we have someone who's chronologically challenged. Gentlemen, well done. Okay, what did we talk about last time? Okay, who would like to volunteer? Who would not like to volunteer? Ms. Caputo, where is Ms. Caputo? Bon journal. Okay, what did we talk about last time that's critical? for the exam. Yeah, cash flow. What's important also, you may not have to do a cash flow on the exam. You may not have to, but you may have to know, for example, the disclosure. So write this down. Listen to me. For the disclosure of a cash flow using either IFRS or private entity. Because it's not just, you know, crunching numbers. I mean, you can pretty well do that yourself at home. But you should know, as accountants, what the formal procedure is. Say, for example, of a private entity for disclosing something like cash flow. What are the disclosure requirements? Either private or IFRS. And you should also know, again, hint, hint, what the policy is for disclosing something like dis discontinued operation for ASP or external reporting. Don't forget, we also cover private entity accounting, which is ASP. We don't just forget about it. It's not just public that we're talking about because there's many, many private companies that don't use IFRS. They're not required to, but if you're traded on a public stock market, you are required in Canada. So we talked about cash flow. So we also talked about the two different types of cash flow. What are they? Not different types, but different ways of preparing it. Who would like to volunteer? Who would, who would not like to volunteer? Ah, that is L. Grant you this privilege. I will grant you the privilege of answering your question. Go ahead. Uh, you can be direct or indirect. Good. So direct versus indirect is critical. Direct is the one that's easiest to prepare. Now you may not have to actually prepare this on the exam, but indirect is the one that's recommended under IFRS. It's the one that's recommended, but you don't have to do it. Why is the direct method the one that's recommended? Well, it's because it's a little bit easier for them to understand. But what do most companies use? Indirect, because it's easier to prepare. There's a cost-benefit trade-off. All right, so this chapter that we're looking at today is not going to be on the exam, at least not the, the midterm. It will be on the final. And I'll be honest with you, this is the chapter that gives people a lot of trouble when it comes the revenue recognition, which is this chapter. It's a critical, critical chapter. So, you want to understand economics, legalities. You want to understand what a company, what earned revenue. The measurement, accounting for sale, consignment sales. Again, you're not just technicians. This is one of the key things we try to emphasize in this course. You are accountants. An accountant should know what we mean by disclosure. Uh, 
discussing the, the trends in standard setting and the difference between ASP and IFRS, I'll summarize it simply and directly for you. The difference between the two methods is this. Under public reporting, you're only allowed percentage of completion. That's it. Whereas under private, you can use completed contract or percentage of completion. So it's more restricted under IFRS. That's one of the main concepts. Okay, so revenue recognition. Again, I'll put this up. Actually, I probably won't put it up until after the midterm because we don't want people studying this and getting confused. Okay, I'll put a note post midterm material. So just listen to me. So again, accounting for revenues is often very complex. Well, that's putting it mildly. Uh, much of the comp is caused by the structure. So sometimes it can be a good, sometimes it can be a service, sometimes it can be a combination of the two. When do we recognize the revenue? This can be a problem because it's one of the real difficulties with accounting. For example, when do you recognize the production of wine? Well, certainly when recognize it what? On the grapevine. Okay? You can't say, oh, there's my bottle of Chablis, I can see it in the grape. No, not likely. But you may recognize it further along the process when it's what? It's been being bottled. It doesn't necessarily have to be sold. So for example, if you have a ready market and you have you know, customers you know that have solid credit worthiness and you've dealt with them before, you may recognize it right when it's bottled. Other companies may be a bit more, again we don't like to use this word because it's not in use anymore, but conservative, i.e. you don't recognize the revenues until the wine is actually shipped and there's a transaction. Now there is, that's a bit of a stumbling block. So, so again, key questions. Again, this tends to be a theory question in the final exam. A lot of people will write a lot of stuff. Now people have asked me, some have asked me, how do we do well in a case? Well, for one thing, don't beat one point to death. You're not going to get any more than one point. You may get the point perfectly, but you're still not going to get more than one point. The other point is this. Make sure that you do what? That you explain the introduction, the analysis, and the conclusion, if so required. If it's required. There'll be a bit more theory on this case, uh, excuse me, exam, than say on previous ones, which means I can give you the benefit of the doubt for the midterm, not necessarily for the final. Okay, so what's being given up, what's being received? If I make a sale to you, what's being given up? Well, I could be selling book to you, and you're giving me money. So there's a transaction there. Now, normally specify in sales agreement. So what is not recognized as a sale, if I go to the top of the building and start throwing books off and helping the people catch it, then I'm making a sale. Why? Why is that not recognized as a sale? Why is it different than if I sell a book to say this gentleman over here? What's the difference? Okay, so don't, worry. don't worry about the camera, it won't bite you. We stop for day. Well, you know you don't have two parties that agree to transaction. If a book lands on my head, I haven't agreed to have the book landing on my head. Okay? But if you sell something, that's a whole different story. You sell something, you agree to a transaction, that the rights and responsibilities can transferred over you, et cetera, et cetera. So these are things that we look for. So what's being sold? Well, we all know that even if you buy a car, which seems to be one of the most tangible things, so four years ago or three years ago I bought a car, and obviously I bought a tangible good, it's a car, but there's also a service associated. What part of the service? Well, you know as well as I do. Come on. What do you get with a car? A warranty. Yeah, okay. So the first week or so, the car radio didn't work, which to me was tragic because I couldn't speed up and down the highway listening to Van Halen or whatever, okay? But the point is that it was covered under warranty, so it's a bundle. So sales of service. So a physical good. Uh, assets at a finite point when the control transfers. Generally, the transfer is legal title and possession. How does that differ from something like consignment sales? Let's just stop for a second. You've all gone to the bookstore. You've all bought books. Or you've all had sort of a little 
cardiac infraction when you see the price of the books, you just go, ooh. Okay? You know as well as I do, the bookstore does not have title and possession. They're working on consignment with the sales of the books, right? Which means that they're actually working as an agent. And they have to remit the money and what? The, any books that are not sold. This is why they say, you know, books that have not been sold by a certain time get transferred back to the salesperson and so forth. The sale of the service, legal title, possession, is irrelevant. So again, the possession is irrelevant. You can't possess a haircut. You get a haircut. Sales of goods or services. Again, you have to look at the complexity of bundle sales. The majority of sales are bundled. Now what's, again, consideration is being received for goods or services. or cash or cash-like, which means it doesn't always have to be cash that you're getting, but the potential. So non-barter, this is all non-goods, which is also known as a barter. Now, in generally more mature economies, we don't do this. But you can transfer in less stable economies and have a barter system, which does work once in a while. And again, another key concept is an arm's length transaction. I can't sell to myself, can't put money in my left pocket, sell it to my right pocket. Now you learn later in consolidations that when you've got a parent and a subsidiary and you sell to one and the other, you have to eliminate this because they're really the same entity. Okay? That's called intercompany transaction elimination. So you learn this with Pierre or Guillaume Henry or someone like that. Okay? So the value delivered equals the value considered. Now, it's critical to know. So everyone should try at least have six the first edition, look at chapter six. As I said, please don't always think the PowerPoints are there to cover everything. The PowerPoints cover most of the topic, not all of them. So we went over on page 317, we looked at this, uh, reciprocal nature. Let's go to about page 318. So concessionary terms, that's, uh, excuse me, page 319. This is what we're looking at. So it's critical to understand if sales are done under normal terms, specialized unusual. So the lenient for payment, more accommodating, build on holds, and exclusion of extras. So concessionary means additional obligations, means that maybe the control is not passed to the buyer. So we'll look at that when we do some problems. Uh, legalities. Again, this is actually contractual law. This is not a law course, but there is something called contracts that you will take in business law, or at least have at least a, an overview. You go further in the law, you'll, that's a lot that they do. So the rights and the obligation are described or governed by law. So when you have a contract, if it's not stipulated in the contract, you can't just say, well, don't worry about that. Yes, you do worry about that. The contract law is most relevant in as each sales transaction means a contract with the customer. So always read the fine print. Whenever you buy a good or service, usually the combination of the two, you want to look at the fine print. So you bought a washer, what are the what's the fine print that's covered in contractual law? Enforceable obligations. And again, FOB shipping point and FOB destination. I'm going to do my well-worn joke, which I do all the time, please, it's FOB, not SOB. Some of you will write SOB designation or whatever like that. I, you may think that, but please don't write that. Okay, it means freight on board, shipping point, freight on board, destination. So we'll talk about that. From the shipping point, it becomes the buyer property. From the destination, it's still what? The seller until it reaches the destination. So let's suppose you do FOB designation. Okay, you put it in the DHL van or whoever. They drive it. And guess what happens? Well, they have an accident. Okay, the guy has too many whiskeys and he decides he's going to see what a stop sign looks like up front. He gets into an accident. Well, guess what? If it's FOB desti destination, it's still your goods. If it's FOB shipping point, it means that it's the buyer's concern. And again, 
It means that you have to look at inventory. You have to look at inventory on the balance sheet. What is FOB shipping point? What is FOB designation? Watch it. Again, this is all under contractual law. So again, as we said before, inflow and outflow. There's the earnings and the contract-based approach, which again, we're not that worried about for now. The earnings approach, again, if you go to page 323, just at the bottom. Again, study this on August 4th. This material will not be covered in the midterm. We need to study it in detail. Just review it for now. So the risk and rewards of ownership are transferred. The seller has no continuing involvement or no effective control over the sales goods. So the costs and revenues can be reliably measured and collection is probable. That's what we mean by the earnings approach. So when you sell goods, you want to look at the following. The two indicators, who has legal title, who has possession. So in some situations, the risks and rewards consider transfer even if the legal title or possession don't transfer over. So for example, forestry agricultural products with assured prices in the markets, okay? That's an example right there. Uh, services for delivery of goods is the general critical event. For services, performance, you know, which is ongoing, will determine the amount and the timing of the revenue recognition. So, each critical event, again, what they're trying to tell you, that's percentage completion. Now, again, let's look at this. This is important that you see this. Now, please, if you're going to listen, you want to listen for sure. There are two main ways of accounting for long-term contracts and services of contracts. The percentage of completion and completed contracts. So when performance consists of many ongoing acts, then percentage of completion is preferred. When it's one single act, which means bang, it's done, we use the completed contract. But I'll tell you the truth is under IFRS, there's no mention of completed contracts. It doesn't exist. So except, uh, you know, recoverable revenues, etc. So look, if you see the company is a public company, and they ask you, what is the revenue under completed contract method? Well, guess what? That's almost, I wouldn't say a trick question, but pretty close to it. It's telling you this. You can't do it that way. But if it's something like what? A, a private company, they have the choice of both methods. Public companies can only use what? Yeah. Why? Because we use IFRS. Why? Because those are the rules of the game. It's that simple. Don't start making up other rules. Measurability. So we looked at page 323. Uh, selling goods. You want to look at page 324. This is again, selling goods. Uh, process highlights. If you have your book, again, you don't need to look at this for this weekend. After Sunday, you can look at it. But the example that I gave was wine. What we're trying to say is there's too much uncertainty for recognizing wine sales when the grapes are on the vine or you're just planting the, you know, the vineyards. But it goes further along, say, you know, when you're bottling, there's less uncertainty. But when you ship, for sure, there's even less uncertainty than that. So, there's some point in the revenue recognition process when you actually recognize the revenue. There is low uncertainty. Okay? So measurement uncertainty. We can't measure the consideration. We can't remove the cost or the outcome. So, as we said before, you don't, there's really two things, two approaches. You don't met, recognize revenue until the uncertainty is resolved. Sometimes use this. Uh, or revenue, recognize revenue, but measure and accrue the amount relating to the uncertainty as a cost. That's the preferred method. Okay, again, for more complex, the sales, uh, multiple deliveries, gap sets to separate each deliverable, 
again, it can be the fair value, the residual value, yada yada. So, if components cannot be measured individually, applied as a bundle. Collectability. So let's make sure we're on the right page. Go to page 326. We looked at measurability on page 327. Measuring the point of sale. We're now on page 331. As I said before, a lot of this comes a lot clearer when you do the problems. So, in order to recognize revenue at the time of sale, it's necessary to establish ultimate collectability. So it cannot be reasonably measured. So the accounting treatment is the default cash basis and consignment sales. Now, consignment sales are good for exams. Hint, hint. I'll say it again if you're not listening. If you're playing with that electronic contraption called the cell phone, consignment sales are good for exams. Okay, so let's look on page 334, 335. The example is like the bookstore. The bookstore acts as a consignee. Now, why is it when you have something? Okay, who makes this book? Not me. Do you make any money out of these books? Oh, working this summer if you Okay, who makes this book? Okay, who's the publisher? Is it Campbell Soup? No, oh, it's Wiley. Okay, give me other names of publishers. Broadhill, Pearson, right? These are all examples of book publishers. Now let me ask you something. Why do they use bookstores as consignees? Oh, thank you for volunteering on yourself. And your partner in crime. Because we're not going to go buy that. Yeah, are you going to drive to Oakwood or whatever, uh, what's that suburb in Toronto? Mississauga or whatever, okay? You're going to take in your car and drive all the way to Mississauga? Not likely. Would you rather have them ship it to the bookstore here, pay it a little bit more, and have the convenience? Of course. So, the consignee, which is Concordia Bookstore, acts as an agent to sell the inventory. So the possession is transferred, but not the legal title. So the risks and rewards, this is a key thing. The legal title has not been transferred. So the goods are held for the seller as inventory on consignment. You want to make a note of that. Again, I'll put these up for you. But they're not held, uh, again, as inventory on the consignee's book. Okay, So they're not inventory on consignee, but they're you know, inventory on consignment on the consignor's book. So consignor, that's McGraw-Hill consignee. That's Concordia or McGill Bookstore, whoever. Yes? Who will reclaim the taxes on the book? We pay taxes? Right. Who? Well, there'll be, again, there'll be those that'll be selling it. They'll have to pay a, a GST, et cetera, et cetera. And those that will be buying it, they'll have to have a GST on this, and then they do the reconciliation. That's ACO 320. We'll do that. Don't worry. We'll get you there. All right. So the merchandise are sold, the consignment permits cash to the consigner. Okay, nobody works for free, except the teachers. And guess what? They make money on it. So that's one of the reasons. So you're willing to pay that extra money rather than buying something what? Well, you could theoretically buy it online and wait a couple weeks, or just go to the bookstore and make sure you get the right book, the right edition. Okay, so let's look. All right, so this is important. So who is a consignor? McGraw-Hill. Who is a consignee? Concordia Bookstore. So when they sh the goods are shipped to consignment, debit inventory, credit, finished goods, inventory. So it's inventory on consignment, they credit, finished goods, inventory. What they're saying is it's, they moved it to a different inventory. No entry. There's a payment of freight. Inventory on consignment, debit cash. No entry. When there's a sale, okay, so again, you want to look, make sure they didn't make a mistake on the journal entries. All right, so when there's a sale, 
here, you go debit cash, credit payment on consignment, and when they do remittance for the consigner, they do payable, commission revenue, cash. Now be careful with these journal entries because sometimes they make mistakes, okay? So definitely look on page 335. Be very, very careful. Sometimes the people who do these journal entries aren't 100% sure, okay? So we're going to do this. Is this good for your exam? Everybody say yes. Don't be shy. Yes. Okay, one yes. Okay, don't worry, the camera won't bite you. At least not for today. All right, percentage of completion. The cost, the profit, the percentage. Again, this can be an input or an output. Are you going to get this on your final exam? Say yes, master. <laughs> Okay, yeah, you got it. Yes, you're going to get it on your final exam. We asked it last year and someone said, oh, you just said so. So, I'm being recorded. Yes, you're going to get it on your final exam. For sure. You can use output. So it could be stories or building, like, I don't know, the, what's going to call it, the uh, Empire States building. Please. Please, please, write these steps down. There's, you know these steps, you've got at least 10 or 15 marks in the bag right now. Okay? Number one, cost incurred to date over most recent estimate costs. That gives you the percentage complete. Please, if you get something like 65.25, don't round it up to 65.3. 65.25, it's at least the second decimal, preferably even the third decimal, so you don't have a rounding error. Step two, the percentage completion times your estimated total revenue or gross profit, that will be the revenue recognized to date. Step three, the revenue or gross profit will be recognized to date minus the revenue or gross profit minus the prior period, because you don't want to include that again, gives you your current period or gross profit, you, yes? If you're in construction business, right. how do they determine that, like me? Okay, it could be two ways. Uh, usually it's the number of floors completed or percentage completed, okay? okay. So that can be said, there's either input or output measures. Input is how much material that they use. Output, how many stories have they made. So you have a 50-story building, uh, first three months you've done 10. Okay, and you're going to have to recognize the revenue for the 10 divided the 50, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and then from step four, you get the current period. Again, it varies from one industry to the next. Some industries, like buildings, it tends to be, not always, but usually percentage of completion of the floors. So that's what they'll, uh, they'll do. Uh, why are they doing it this way? Why are they using percentage of completion? Think as accountants, not just technicians. Why do you think they do it this way? Who would like to volunteer? Who would not like to volunteer? Okay, well, it's not just one student here. Ah, someone up in the back. Who's sleeping on me? Oh, sir, what a lovely drink you had. It was making me so thirsty when I saw it. Your name? Sean. Sean, still Sean. Okay, why do you think they do this percentage completion method? Why do you think this is done? This completion, on completion. Yeah, it's you're, yeah, you're getting there. Anyone else? Thank you, sir, for volunteering. More, uh, accuracy for measurement? Yeah, it's possible. Yeah, you're getting there. It's smoothing out your income. You don't want no income one period, no income the next period, then bang, big whack. So it's income smoothing. It makes stocks, etc. You know, as we said, the stocks will respond to this type of method. You know, based on percentage, etc., etc. Now, here's an example. Here's your information. Just on the off chance that you don't have the book on you, go to page 336. Write it down in your notes. Page 336. This is all the information right here. Now, we're only going to give you two years. The third one you can do yourself. Now, this again, if you get this question, it's very journal intensive. So 
So your cost to date, your estimated cost to complete your progress and your cash collection during the year. So let's look at the first couple journal entries. All right, well, let's do the formulas first, okay? You've got the year 214, 215, and 216. You have your cost to date, your estimated cost, you have four million. So, again, your total gross profit, which is A minus B, your percentage of completion, as we said before. And then 215, again, your cost to date, your cost to complete, your estimated total gross profit, and your percentage of completion, of course. If it takes three years, you hope it's going to be 100% complete, and it better be. And away we go. So first, let's look at the journal entries. So again, if you don't have the book, well, if you do have the book, look at page 337. You do debit construction in process, credit materials, cash payable. You do debit account receivable, debit billing construction, and when you record the collections, debit cash, credit accounts receivable. Now they do this for 214 and 215. 216 is not shown because they don't have enough space, but it's essentially the same journal entries. So for 215, debit, construction, materials, uh, accounts receivable, billing, and cash accounts receivable. So let's keep going. So like they said, journal entries for 216 are not shown because of space limitations, but don't think you don't have to do them. Now, you can use percentage of completion, cost to cost basis, that's fine. It works that way also. And then you can recognize the gross revenue and the, the, the revenue, the gross profits of debit construction, process, construction expense, revenue, credit revenue from long-term contract, debit billing construction to construction and process. So again, 216 are not shown to the space. Now, very important because we are not just crunching numbers. The presentation is critical. The difference between construction and process and billing and construction is recorded on the balance sheet as one of the two. A current asset or current liability. Okay. Now it may or may not be non-current depending on the length. Okay, so we looked at page 338, page 339. And again, the balance construction uh, process account represents the cost, and again, the billing. Now, completed contract, here's an example. Is this allowed under IFRS? Who said yes? Everyone say, in your own language, nine, yet, nada, el no, and whatever. You can't do it. Okay, I'm going to say this, but someone is going to do this. They're going to say, power through nothing. I said, well, can you just pretend, pretend it's private? I said, no, can't do that. Okay. All right, the revenue and the gross profits are recognized on completion. So what are the advantages? The advantages are pretty clean. Well, the revenue is recognized in actual sales, not estimates. So you're not really, estimates can be off. They are off, okay? Disadvantages doesn't reflect current performance. So all the journal entries are the same, except that no entry is recognized at the end of the period to recognize revenue and gross profit. So the entries are all the same, except recognizing revenue and gross profit. They don't do this. IFRS does not address this method explicitly. You know, what are they telling you in simple language? It's not allowed. You can't do it this way under IFRS. If you have a private company, okay, remember we said about private firms to their, are they all small? No, no, no. Remember we met, gave you an example of a very big private company in the United States called Bechtel? What is their business? Not selling Bechtels. Construction. Okay, as I told you, they're one of the biggest construction companies on earth. They are a private company, they're American, but they also have a Canadian subsidiary that's under a slightly different name, 
and they can use ASP or what? IFRS. They are allowed to use one or the other. So again, look at some of the differences. You've got 214, 215, 216, away you go. Look at the, there, the gross profit. You don't recognize anything until the end. Now, the difference with this is you don't get income smooth, and you get like bumps in the income. And this is a problem, okay? That's why IFRS doesn't like this. It creates waves. All right, long-term contract lease. Again, we don't want to go too crazy on this. Let's see where long-term contract lease is. All right, it should be around um, page 341, okay? So, intern walks, percentage of completion, et cetera, et cetera. And again, so forth. We're actually gonna stop the lecture for chapter six here. We're going to continue finishing off. So we're really on page 342. I don't want to go too far on this. Because if you go too far on this, people say, well, what is up the exam? Okay, so next class we finish off all the way to about page 350. And that's it. So we really have about eight pages left in chapter six. We'll start a little bit of chapter seven. What I want to do next is, since we have midterm, see we really don't have that much to do as you see. And we stopped at slide 31, and it really goes to about slide 41. Okay, so we don't want to kill chapter 6 in one swoop, because most people won't be listening. So, what chapters are on your exam? One more time. Is chapter 6 on your exam? It's on your final. You'll get them in the end. Okay, chapter 22 is going to be on your exam also. Chapter 21 will be on your exam. It will be correction of error. It will be on your exam. Alright, so what you should know, I'm going to give you a major hint. Look at chapter 21 for correction of errors. Look at chapter 21 for also uh, changes in estimates. What is also of some importance is presenting the shareholders' equity. Remember I talked about you? This is one of the things that's different. How does it differ under IFRS? Do you have the statement of shareholders' equity under private entity? Now, old guys like me, the guys who are going to the golden oldies or the warriors of the 1980s, whatever, we don't, for us it's kind of strange to see that, but yes, under IFRS you're responsible for that. What else is important in the exam? I'll give you, there'll be multiple choice. Okay? The multiple choice are okay, they're not bad. I'll give you another major hint. One of the questions at the end says, what, again, what is the presentation format for discontinued operations and cash flow? So you should know both the disclosure formats, either under private or public. So give me information. Don't just say, oh yes, we have to disclose it in the notes. No kidding. But you have to explain a lot more. There will be for example, one of the questions says, how would you show this on the balance sheet? Okay, or well, the statement of financial position is a proper name. Would this be shown at fair market value? Would it be shown at historical cost, etc.? So for example, um, equipment, what would be shown at? Now, would it be shown at historical cost now? No, you're right, it's shown where? It, Fair market value. Okay, so uh, OCI, other comprehensive income. Where would you find it? And how would it what what would be the valuation? There will also be some questions on you know what are the user's needs? What what's really chapter two is what it's saying, okay? What are the user's needs? Don't just say they need more relevant and reliable or financial. Faithful. Yeah. 
obviously, but explain what they need. What are the user's needs? So that's really chapter two. Uh, there'll be, of course, chapter three, some corrections. Chapter 21 will be there a bit. You may not have to prepare a cash flow because you've done it before and what, what where, where did you do cash flow before? COM 217. COM 217. Does this court called COM 217 revisited? Nope. Okay. Otherwise, it's a waste, you know, we're just making you redo stuff. So you should know how to do the disclosure of cash flow and the disclosure of discontinued operations, both private and public. Uh, we'll give you a few more hints, okay, for next class. So stay tuned. If you have this information, if you don't show up next class, you can show it to, you can sell it to your friend for top dollar. Yes? Should we know not the ratio itself, but how could, let's say, uh, the presentation of financial statements quote the ratios or something? Nothing to do with ratios at all. Okay, you have permission to perform washi Gary on me. That's that's karate for a roundhouse. Okay. okay, where you kick me is up to you. Okay, preferably not in some place. There's some danger to me, but yes, no, there's no NO ratios at all. There's about five questions. There's multiple choice. Uh, chapter 21 plays a, a major role. Chapter 3 is there. Uh, you don't have to prepare the cash flow per se. We did it last term. So this term you don't have to prepare it so much. But you should know that you know the disclosure for cash flow and discontinued operations be able to explain what they are. How they, how they present it, both private and public. I'll give you a few more hints next class. Okay. Oh my goodness, you lucky guys. You're so lucky. Let's look at chapter 22. Uh, let's see if we can get you a question presentation. Okay, I'm looking for questions. Okay, if you can do B, that's fine. 